Hey everybody, we're going to talk today about immigration in the United States through the lens of the aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. So first, just some housekeeping to ensure that we're all on the same page about what aggregate demand is. It effectively equals the components of GDP, gross domestic product. So that's personal consumption, which pertains to households, private investments, which pertains to businesses, government purchases, and net exports, which are exports minus imports. Aggregate supply, on the other hand, has a few determinants. It intersects with aggregate demand to determine equilibrium GDP. And the determinants of aggregate supply are typically seen as some version of the following four things on your screen, right? Some, some amount of capital, access to natural resources, the labor force is in the equation, and some variable for the productivity of labor and capital. Let's take a quick look at the kind of... Uh, broad picture of immigration in the U.S. So these are some figures on estimates of the population of immigrants in the United States. The 2020 number isn't available yet as of this recording, but the latest estimates had set it at around 14% of the U.S. population made up of immigrants, or roughly 47 to 48 billion, I'm sorry, 47 to 48 million people in the United States. You can estimate that of that, perhaps somewhere between 10 to 12 million of them are in the U.S. illegally, undocumented. And if we wanted a more detailed breakdown, we can see the percentage of authorized and unauthorized immigrants, the 25% of immigrants in the United States who may be living here illegally. And you can see what the proportion of authorized immigrants are to that and what type of breakdowns we have of authorized immigrants in the US. So I wanted to give this first slide as a as a kind of setting the stage for understanding what we are talking about when we're talking about immigration to the United States, right? The overwhelming majority of this immigration is from people who are who have no legal restriction per se to contributing to the economy. And we can also at the end of this presentation, hopefully by the end of the presentation, understand better the economic contributions and the economic costs for those who are unauthorized. But let's explore the contributions of immigrants a little bit further. Um, first, understanding how immigration in the U.S. has changed over time, right? Arguably, the U.S. immigration policy before the 1960s was, by most historians considered to be focused on keeping the U.S. some version of quote-unquote white. Of course, the definition of white changed over time, and the modern definition is not necessarily what was the definition of whiteness um, even during World War II. So it's, it's important to understand that over time up to the 60s, there were definitely quotas in the U.S. immigration policy that allowed for certain parts of Europe, but not all Europeans to be considered white. In addition to that, U.S. foreign policy is really a part of U.S. immigration policy, so it's also critical to understand that what we're seeing here is also a shifting after the 1960s towards a posture both in immigration and in other aspects of foreign policy that was meant to be more hostile towards the Soviet Union and the satellite nations that may be influenced by them. And immigration policy, to some extent, may have been used to undermine efforts from the Soviet Union and satellite nations to really undergo economic transformations that would have been more favorable to socialists, right, by creating... 
some level of brain drain. That's part of the understanding of U.S. Foreign, U.S. immigration policy since 1965, Hart Seller Act, which more or less added more access for immigration to the U.S. based on refugee status, but also based on what's sometimes been called chain migration or like family relationships. Um, arguably, one side of why that shifting occurred is that there was more of a effort to make the U.S. immigration uh, framework less biased towards certain groups that were preferred, perhaps, in the, on the federal level, and more of an accessibility based on need and prior relationships to people who might be in the country already. Um, some historians have argued that the expectations from this policy were also that it would just perpetuate the whiteness goal in another kind of format that you would have more Europeans who would have family members in the United States who would also then try to bring other family members from Europe who would also be white with them. Um, but what you see here is that by 2013, and it's following the years of data look very similar, is that U.S. immigration patterns became much more focused on nations of color and especially those from the part from parts of Asia and in, in particular the Pacific Rim, but also from Latin America and especially from our southern neighbor Mexico, which has probably one of the most noticeable increases in its proportion of the uh, immigration population change from nineteen sixty to twenty thirteen. If we wanted to look at this from even a little bit more drastic points, right, we could look at uh, this breakdown here from 1910 to 2017. You can see just how dramatically immigration into the United States has shifted away from Europe and towards Asia, Latin America, and uh, Central America in particular, but also more of an influence from Africa, right? You can see this same kind of dynamic playing out even over a shorter time span, looking from the 1990s to the 2010s. You can see that even over this most recent time span, immigration from Europe and Canada has fallen, while immigration from Southeast Asia and Latin America and Mexico has been on the rise. So let's take a look at now, contributions from immigrants to personal consumption. Now that we have this kind of broad idea of who is the immigrant in the United States or who are the immigrants in the United States, let's take a look now at kind of some of the ways that they contribute to the aggregate demand side. So in 2014, immigrants attained about $1.3 trillion in household income. And the idea here isn't really just for this, understanding this figure for this year, but really appreciating that this is a standard. This isn't, 2014 was not a normal year. Immigrants bring in over a trillion dollars in household income every year, which matters uh, significantly to GDP, right? It's, it's a part of the purchasing power. And if you're considering in particular where immigrants are concentrated, which is like heavily in coastal cities, um, you can uh, you can have even better appreciate how for many of these more local urban economies, immigrants can be a very powerful force. Um, in New York, for example, twenty three percent of the spending power is held by immigrants. That you couldn't just have that fall out of the economy and not experience dramatic effects. Uh, with the chart on the right, I wanted to demonstrate how much of the impact from immigrants is really generational, right? So this is a narrative that you'll see is repeated throughout of immigrants having a multi-generational impact on the economy. And just looking at the impact of the first generation, the people who are coming into the United States doesn't necessarily 
do justice to where this narrative ends up. Um, rates of home ownership, household income, college graduation, they almost all increase with the second generation. And in some cases, they increase in ways where they exceed the average for the entire U.S. For example, college graduation rates among second generation immigrants are higher than the U.S. average. Poverty rates for second generation immigrants are lower than the U.S. average, in addition to being lower than the first generations. So this multi-generational narrative is going to be a consistent theme that will come across. Um, you can see how this breaks down between racial groups of immigrants. And what's really notable here is how much the narrative for black immigrants differs from that of Asian and Hispanic ones in how second generation black immigrants tend to have lower median incomes than the first generation. Uh, this really speaks to how much of the racial problem in the United States is particular versus what's happening perhaps in other parts of the globe. Um, just coming to the United States as a black immigrant itself isn't, it, it, it is already to some extent, right, perhaps disadvantageous compared to other immigrants. I mean, you can see that even just looking at this, like Hispanic versus Asian versus black, first generation black immigrants are making on median a little bit more than first generation Hispanics, but less than the first generation Asians. And we'll talk a bit more about how much of that is um, related to visa policies around STEM focused jobs. But then having a second generation child in the mix which is usually accompanied with um, more of a assimilation into blackness. Right? There are usually less identifiers for the second generation black immigrant that makes it clear that this person is a descendant of an immigrant. For example, accents are usually lost by the second generation or with the second generation child. Um, if there is a, a language that was that is usually native to the country, that this first generation immigrant came from, the second generation child may know it, but they're probably not speaking it primarily, especially in social circles with friends and in school in the US. So the less clear identifiers of the person that you're talking to is an immigrant. And it seems that what accompanies that is to some extent a drop in median incomes. So there are definitely multiple mechanisms for how this could occur or how this could be occurring, right? We'll learn throughout the curriculum that there are different um, non-economic barriers that are typically thrown in the way of women and black Americans in the United States in a way that makes it very obvious here that you know coming to the US as opposed to the narrative that happens to other immigrants being black and assimilating into the United States as a person who just looks and is black and is socializing in the U.S. as a black American is accompanied with a on, on, on sample lower median income. That's important to understand. We don't see that for other uh, racial groups and the question is why? What is happening to black immigrants that once they become more American, once their children become Americans, there's suddenly kind of more downward pressure on their incomes. So we can see that for immigrants versus native born Americans, college graduation rates are a little bit lower for the immigrants, but they're in comparable ranges, right? Literally 32 versus 31%. We can look at this also over um, racial groups, and this probably makes the prior slide seem even more particularly damning because what we see here is that college completion is higher for second generation immigrants across all racial groups. You see that this is happening even for black 
second generation immigrants. So the children of black immigrants, despite having higher college completion rates than their parents, are experiencing lower median incomes. So their median income drop is in it's in opposition to what should be happening with the level of investment that they're making into human capital factors that would translate to better economic outcomes. This speaks even further to the likelihood that what they are experiencing in their median income drops is probably related to some systemic problems in the economy related to discrimination, or at least to some extent, to unequal outcomes, which maybe are not entirely related to entire intentional discrimination, but the outcome is regarded as the same. And I mean, there are other sociological considerations that would lead one to conclude that yes, there is active discrimination still occurring, but regardless, what we see here is unequal outcomes that do not reflect the level of economic investment that is being done by people who would fall into this categorization. We can look at the educational attainment of immigrants versus the second generation of immigrants versus native born Americans here. What we see is that there is a disproportionate skewing for immigrants towards the lower part of the educational spectrum, for sure. But by the second generation, their distribution of educational attainment is very similar to the distribution of native-born Americans. And in some cases, you see higher rates, or higher percentages, I should say, of the group population in the higher parts of the educational distribution versus what's going on with native-born Americans. So for example, you see that there are less um, second-generation immigrants attaining high school degrees or of the population of second-generation immigrants, fewer of them are holding high school degrees as their highest level of attainment versus Americans who are native born. But as we get further up the educational distribution, when you start to see college completion and bachelor degrees, you're seeing a higher proportion of second generation immigrants holding bachelor degrees than of the total of US born, native born Americans. Same thing for the master's degrees. Second generation immigrants, higher proportion of their population are holding master's degrees versus native-born U.S. Um, Americans, and so on and so forth as we go up the, the educational attainment distribution. So it's interesting that the second generation of immigrants are more likely than others in the economy of, or in the categorizations that we're considering here, to have these higher levels of human capital investment. Now, the natural question is with what we see in educational distributions for immigrants, is there a possibility that they are crowding out other American workers, right? And what we see from research of this is that there isn't really a significant crowding out effect. And where there is evidence of the possibility of one, it's typically concentrated among low educational attainment men, and in particular, more significantly, among immigrants in general. So more importantly, or perhaps more significantly, there's evidence that immigrants crowd out each other, that new immigrants perhaps have a downward pressure on wages than for immigrants who are already in the country. And what you can see from the table to the right is that this is probably somewhere around 5.9% um, to 4.5% downward pressure for, of immigrants in the U.S. For 
Americans, U.S. born Americans, we're looking at this really only having a negative, a really significant negative effect on men with less than a high school educational attainment. And it's at around 1.5%. So it's not even as large as the estimates for other immigrants. And when we really look at a bunch of studies that have been conducted since the 1990s, you really don't see that much of an effect, even from the studies that do estimate a negative effect on low-skilled wages. It really does not exceed 1% for most of these studies. And in some cases, there have been evidence of modest positive effects. So immigrants may typically take the kind of jobs that act as peripheral, like, enabling jobs, right? They enable other jobs in the United States to exist because they take some of the burden off of having that job by providing services that may cater to people in those fields. So, you know, have, we'll see some examples of the jobs that immigrants may end up taking. And you'll see that it's not a singular story as this whole thing has been, but um, in the sense that this whole thing has been a multi-narrative <laughs> here where it's like, well, immigrants have this range of, of effects and this range of stories that, of what's happening with them. But you'll see what kind of jobs may be particularly beneficial to higher skilled um, service workers in the sense that these jobs make those other high school service work jobs a little bit easier to tolerate. So let's go a little further in. Let's talk a bit about the interactions with government expenditures. This is always a fun side of things. Right. The narrative has often been that immigrants are a drain on the public coffers. Um, and part of that has been this idea that they don't pay taxes, the largely this myth that they do not pay taxes. And at the same time, they benefit from all the services that you as an American citizen may benefit from. So that's typically crux on the idea that immigrants are socioeconomically vulnerable. And that's very true that immigrants tend to be more likely to be in poverty, more likely to lack health insurance, and are more likely to require some level of uh, aid from the government. What they qualify for is another question. Often this aid takes the form of SNAP and Medicaid benefits, but um, we'll see in a bit why that's a nuanced narrative around how they participate in these programs and how likely they are to participate in these programs. The totality of the narrative, though, really hinges around what the average immigrant is doing, right? There tends to be a socioeconomic vulnerability, but that is not necessarily the average case. The average immigrant is paying $1,800 more in taxes than they collect in government benefits. And part of that is because, you know, the immigration story ranges from refugees who may be in need of immediate government aid to survive in the United States to people who are coming to the U.S. because they have H-1 visas that allow them to work on high-paying STEM fields and projects that are taxed dramatically because they are high earners, but they do not necessarily benefit from all of the um, all of the government benefits that accrue to high earning Americans. So they may be high earners, but they're not going to get Social Security. Right. And that results in, on that, that you have the average effect from immigrants being that they pay far more in taxes and they collect in benefits. This can also vary by age, of course, where older immigrants will be more likely to require government aid, as is the case for older everybody. <laughs> um, from our best understanding, right, and of course the, the asterisk of all of this is that, like, we, these studies are not perfect, but they are usually a high standard of trying to find out this information. And they all do come to very similar conclusions, which suggests that there isn't that much variability in the measure of this figure, which is comforting if we assume that the, the metrics measuring it are accurate. 
really only 1% of undocumented immigrants may receive benefits illegally. And that is very congruent with a lot of other metrics on our people abusing X system by having illegal access to it. It's typically a very small amount when you're talking about U.S. Um, government aid systems for individual households. That is particular. That does not necessarily apply to forms of government transfer payments to corporate or otherwise business organized entities. But when you're talking about households, you're typically talking about one very small 1% slivers of fraud occurring. Um, and you can see that we have figures on the right that are a little bit more uh, particular about where immigrants are subsidizing the system um, and where they are contributing more in taxes, but also where there's some areas of need. Um, I'm not going to go into details on that one, but you can see them over there. I want to bring your attention particularly, though, to this figure that really breaks down the a the the sources of income for households based on whether or not they are U.S. born versus immigrant households. And what you can see is that for immigrant households, as much as there may be a higher likelihood to be of being socioeconomically vulnerable, one that may vary by age, what you're seeing is that for the average household, they are. Um, I'm sorry, actually not even for the average household, because what we're looking at here is share of income by source for households with children below 200% of the federal poverty line. So even when you're looking at these disproportionately poor households in the United States in general, if we're talking about immigrant households, they have a smaller share of their income covering from government aid versus the comparable U.S. born household. So Again, if this is a story of like, well, how much are the neediest immigrants draining the system? The, what we get from this is, you know, there's A, the ghost, these immigrants, but it is by far smaller in proportion to the A that ends up going to U.S. born households. So even if we're looking for efficiencies, this isn't necessarily probably where we can find efficiencies in our budgets. Now, just a few big numbers to kind of give you an idea of what's going on with immigrants and taxes and government coffers. They're paying around $328 billion in federal, state, and local taxes annually. You can see how this breaks down by subgroup. And, of course, the subgroup breakdowns are not adjusted for population, so... Some of the numbers are larger for groups because there are more of them in the United States. Here we're looking at the net fiscal contribution, which is interesting because what we're seeing is basically the net impact on government budgets from different hypothetical household, um, well, different hypothetical groups of uh, native and foreign-born 25-year-olds. And what we're seeing here is that, for the most part, you have a more positive net fiscal contribution from immigrants to government budgets versus similar contribution or in some cases, um, withdrawal from the system from U.S. born Americans. Uh, let's look at, for example, those with less than a high school degree or diploma. And what you can see is that the U.S. born are having a more deleterious effect on government budgets than immigrants with that same educational attainment. And part of that is that, you know, at that low educational level, both groups are probably in need of some level of aid from the government because of the lack of jobs that would be available to them and the lack of well-paying jobs that would be available with so little um, human capital available. So 
you would expect negative numbers regardless, but we see that there's a larger negative effect from having an American-born resident who has probably full access to the array of benefits versus an immigrant-born, um, an, or I should say an immigrant resident who does not have access to the same array of benefits. And when you get higher to higher educational attainments, including to the advanced degree, you see either comparable levels as you may see with like the bachelor's degree where immigrants have a lower positive contribution with, compared to similar bachelor degree holding American born residents. But throughout the whole distribution, the dynamic is typically that the higher the educational, the, I'm sorry, the dynamic is that immigrants are contributing more to government budgets than what you see coming from similarly categorized American-born residents. Contributions now to the aggregate supply side, the labor force and business dynamism. First thing to think about is how the labor force is aging. From in 1994, you had the largest part of the labor force concentrated within people who are between the ages of 25 and 44. Looking at the projections for 2024, though, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we're seeing that the concentrations will be really more evenly distributed and, in particular, weighing more on people over the age of 55, who will go from representing 11.9% of the labor force in 1994 to over or almost a quarter of the labor force by 2024. That has a lot of implications on what will happen when those people then suddenly enter retirement and the 16 to 24 year olds behind them are only making up 11.3% of the current labor force. Will there be enough in the government coffers <laughs> to ensure that those 55 plus year olds are able to enjoy the kind of lifestyle that they expect at old age? There are other issues also at play here in that native born American residents tend not to have as many children and there is actually a negative um, population growth rate associated with that if you're looking at the years of 2000 to 2017. Compare that though to immigrants who in 2000 to 2017 had a positive population growth rate. So to some extent there is a level of hope and you've seen this happen with other developed nations like Japan in particular is being focused on more recently where there's been this kind of emerging turn towards immigrants as a part of the a part of the plan to address the aging of the labor force and the lack of population growth among native born residents across the developed world, which in part may be associated with what has been the kind of penalties of capitalism and childbirth. You know, women who have kids in our economy are almost certain to have lower incomes for the rest of their life compared to the version of themselves that did not have a child, as well as compared to men in the same economy. So there's a penalty to this that doesn't necessarily translate well if you are a single adult, and there is a higher likelihood today of having households made up of single adults because there is not as much household formation happening as was happening prior to the 1970s even. Um, all this comes together to really create an environment where you are less likely to have a child if you are a native born and have a lot of investment in the economic outcomes in the future versus if you are an immigrant who maybe already has a base of understanding that you want to have a certain kind of family, a certain number of children, 
and coming into the United States for you is an economic opportunity to have that and to create opportunities for them. So you see this translate on the right hand side of this figure over time, native born birth rates have been, or I should say native born population growth rates have been in the tank for years from 1995 to 2017. Um, the role of immigrants in rejuvenating the labor force is very real. And you can see here some of the industries that have the most foreign-born workers. And this is critical to what I was talking about before, where you see a lot of foreign-born workers in food and hospitality, manufacturing, construction. Um, these areas, personal services, transportation, these areas where there's a lot of support for people who are working in the service field and a lot of support for not just their jobs directly in the sense of like, oh, I work in food and hospitality, so, you know, I serve the people who are working in these services jobs, these like financial jobs, but also in fields like transportation, like I keep the system around these workers running and I allow these workers to be able to get from X to Y manufacturing, construction, these are fields that are necessary to creating the offices and building the kinds of capital that enable a financial service oriented economy to function. So immigrants are contributing a lot to those areas that enable other American workers to be high earnings and successful. But again, this isn't a narrative that is just monolithic. If we are looking at immigrants across the spectrum of jobs, you do see a disproportion across spectrum of jobs as well as across generations. You do see that while the first generation is disproportionately more likely to end up in service, construction, production and transportation, when we talk about the children of these immigrants, they are more likely to end up in a lot of what we call these white collar jobs, right? Sales, office work, professional fields like legal services, um, business and finance. In some cases, they are more likely than a native born American resident would be to end up in these fields. So it's not, again, a monolithic story because you also see immigrants from the first generation in these fields as well. But it's also not necessarily a, um, a single, a singular time period narrative either. It's not just about the current immigrants, but it's also about the potential incomes, the potential purchasing power, the potential economic and government fiscal power generated by their children. And you can see the, again, over generations, the percentage of immigrant and the percentage of immigrant related workers goes up in many of these fields. When you're talking about parents versus the second generation, um, the second generation children, and looking at this over uh, different ethnic and racial groups is interesting because again you kind of see evidence that for black immigrants the median income outcomes that they are experiencing are not necessarily a result of anything economic we're talking about higher college graduation rates for the second generation but also even a higher percentage in professional fields so you would expect that both of those things coming together would result in median incomes for black second generation immigrants that would be higher than their parents. And you don't necessarily see that play out in the data. Um, what you see play out in the data though, in many cases, is how much of the immigration to the US is specialized in professional fields for certain nationalities and ethnicities. For Chinese and Indian immigrants, there is definitely a high amount of immigration coming to the U.S. resulting in professional occupations being held when they arrive. And that is, again, because a lot of their immigration is through visa programs trying to fill STEM-related fields in the U.S. that just, we don't have as much of a domestic training to fill. But this story isn't 
all focused on it, like the immigration narrative as a or the immigrant as a worker right immigrants are also very likely to be entrepreneurs and you can see this in how many businesses are owned by immigrants with less than a high school diploma 28.4 percent um between 1995 and 2005 over 25 percent of the tech and engineering firms launched in the u.s were founded by immigrants and you see in California, that figure goes even higher, over 38%, especially in Silicon Valley, where you're looking at like over 52%. So the immigration story in the U.S. definitely ends up being not just one about them as a worker, but also as a um, entrepreneur and a source of business dynamism, biz businesses being started in the country take a look at their contributions to technology and productivity in the next section. 75% um, of patents issued at the top 10 patent producing universities typically go to immigrants. Uh, in 2006, talking about 24.2% of patents originating in the U.S. were filed by immigrants, so just a sample of what it may typically look like. Around a quarter of patents internationally that originate in the U.S. are filed by immigrants. And you can see research on immigrant effects on patenting. Usually you see positive um, effects not only for the uh, immigrants themselves as far as how much they are contributing to patents being developed in the U.S., but also how much of their work is contributing to the general agglomeration of patenting that happens in these institutions. Having more immigrants tends to have a more positive effect on the patenting output of other academics, other entrepreneurs, other researchers in the field. So just in general now, looking at what would be the net impact on GDP, the kind of wrap up here, right? What, what is the effect on output, which is the end point that we are really caring about when we're talking about looking at immigration immigrants' effects on the economy. It's maybe not the only end, end point of value, but it's the easiest to quantify, right? So if we were to look at three hypothetical situations that have been measured out by the Congressional Budget Office, um, the outcome that results in more immigrants having a track to occupations in the United States, including those who are undocumented, typically comes out as being the one that results in the highest growth rates for GDP in the U.S. So you see here there's a bar for it if S744 was enacted, which would have basically been a, um, a bill to create a path to citizenship for unauthorized immigrants and also other economic opportunities from what I'm recalling. That results in projections for U.S. GDP growth that are in excess of what the CBO was projecting around that time. And really does fall in line with other research that suggests that the more inclusive we become of immigrants in the United States, and in particular immigrants who may have also come into the U.S. without documentation, the more of a net positive effect we see in U.S. GDP growth. And really that results from all the things that we talked about leading up to this point, right? The effect of immigrants on the United States directly in terms of how much income they bring in, how much of that goes into taxes, how little of those taxes they actually receive in benefits, how much they contribute to business creation in the United States, how much they contribute to rejuvenating a labor force that is aging and requires people who are willing to work in not only low educational attainment fields, right, fields that are typically frowned upon as fields for American residents, but also in fields where we don't train as many American residents to be prepared to take those kinds of jobs. So a lot of the science, technology, and engineering fields, right, creating these pathways, 
it, it's not just a result from, um, or I should say creating these pathways for the undocumented don't only have positive effects for other similarly economically placed immigrants or residents, but also has effects for everybody else who depends upon the economy that they end up bringing more money, labor, and businesses into. So you can see this also in different projected growth rates that have been estimated um, by ProPublica. They actually have a interactive where you can kind of play around with different levels of immigration in the United States, look at historically unprecedented levels and estimates of what would happen to U.S. GDP growth based on these different levels of immigration and whether or not we try to deport all unauthorized immigrants, what would happen potentially to GDP, and what would happen potentially if we tried to legalize all unauthorized immigrants and bring them into the fold of the economy. So I encourage you to play around with that if you get a chance. But that is really the overview of immigration in the U.S. through the lens of aggregate supply, aggregate demand model. And you can hopefully understand that we focused a lot on these components of aggregate demand and aggregate supply that are really outlined in detail. But there's a lot of interaction between the effects that they have on different components. There's a lot of interaction with other more sociological aspects of what's happening in the economy. You know, there would probably be even more beneficial effects from immigration, perhaps if black immigrants did not necessarily have negative median income effects by the second generation, right? So there's a lot going on here that really reflects not only the economic narrative, but also the kind of just in general sociological outcomes for them. Um, hopefully, though, this illuminates a lot more about immigrants in the U.S. as part of the economy in a way that isn't just informed by kind of media narratives around what's happening at the southern border or even media narratives around how jobs are being taken both by, I guess, you know, low-skilled immigrants as well as high-skilled immigrants. Hopefully this gives you a better idea of what is occurring and how they fit into issues as well as strengths for the U.S. economy.